Our next presenter is Dr. Scott Nagasawa, someone whose medical presentations I've had the pleasure of enjoying for over 10 years. Scott received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Southern California and is a registered pharmacist. He spent over 12 years at a large teaching hospital in Los Angeles, California, affiliated with the University of Southern California, where he served as the Director of Pharmaceutical Services. During this period, Scott also held the position of Clinical Instructor of Pharmacy Practice at USC and later as Adjunct Assistant Professor of Pharmacy Practice. Scott transitioned into the private sector with a regional pharmacy, serving as a Vice President of Pharmacy Services. He was instrumental in the planning and implementation of a strategic business plan that transformed the company from a regional to a nationwide pharmacy service. As Senior Vice President of Professional Services, Scott was responsible for nursing and pharmacy operations. Scott became a partner with a small home infusion service provider where he developed and implemented a business plan that resulted in rapid growth. The company was sold to a large pharmacy provider in California where he also served as Vice President of Operations. Dr. Nagasawa joined the company Celgevity, founded by himself, his father, Dr. Herbert T. Nagasawa, his brother, Dr. Stuart Nagasawa, and Scott Nomi. Scott Nagasawa served as Chief Technical Officer for the startup company responsible for product registration, company certifications, regulatory practices, safety studies, technical sales support, and the development and reviewing of product documentation. Scott currently serves on the MAX International Science Research Team as Executive Director of Product Research. It is great pleasure that I introduce you to Dr. Scott Nagasawa. Thank you, Scott. I hope everybody is well and we're all staying healthy by practicing safe distancing. I would like to acknowledge Bobby Horn for all of our hard work behind the scenes in organizing this event. My presentation will be about 45 minutes in length and will primarily focus on the research and development arrival scene. Since Dr. Smith spoke about the different types of free radicals and the interplay with the antioxidants, this will not be included in my presentation. As she pointed out, the scientific community regard glutathione as a master antioxidant because glutathione plays a significant role in maintaining cellular homeostasis. There have been many advances in cellular biochemistry in the last three decades, which has provided us with a better understanding of cellular oxidative stress and its relationship to inflammation and disease development. Glutathione and the glutathione enzymes are crucial in the cell's defense against oxidative stress. As a result, glutathione has gained attention from researchers all over the world, surpassing the research of other antioxidants with over 150,000 published studies. This is the outline I plan to follow today. I will review the different types of antioxidants that make up our antioxidant defense system that protect our cells against free radical damage. I'll give a brief introduction to glutathione's biochemistry. We'll discuss how glutathione functions as an antioxidant, a detoxifier, an immune system enhancer. What are the many causes of glutathione depletion? The research and development of ribosine by Dr. Herbert Agasawa, which was specifically designed to support the natural production of glutathione. And this will include reviewing the early proof of concept studies. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Our natural antioxidant defense system that protects our cells against free radical damage is made up of three distinct groups of antioxidants. And these three groups of antioxidants all work together to neutralize the different types of free radicals that we are exposed to. The first group of antioxidants that make up this defense system are the exogenous antioxidants, or simply those antioxidants that we get through the foods that we eat. This includes vitamin C, vitamin E, your flavonoids, your polyphenols, as well as all the other antioxidants we receive in our diets. Therefore, it's important we consume these antioxidants with a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. The second group of antioxidants that are part of this defense system are the endogenous antioxidants. And these antioxidants are naturally produced by the body for the purpose of protecting our cells against free radical damage. And this group includes glutathione, alpha lipoic acid, and coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10. Glutathione 
as you may suspect, plays a key role as part of this defense system. And I'll talk more about this in detail a bit later. The third and final group are the endogenous antioxidant enzymes. These include the superoxide dismutase enzyme, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and there are other glutathione enzymes as well. Both glutathione and superoxide dismutase are found in the mitochondria of our cells to neutralize a superoxide free radical, which is the most common free radical that we're exposed to. The superoxide dismutase enzyme will convert the superoxide free radical to hydrogen peroxide and oxygen. The enzyme catalase further reduces the hydrogen peroxide to harmless water and oxygen. The glutathione peroxidase enzyme also detoxifies the peroxides and its activity has been associated with cardiovascular disease. Therefore, the activity of this enzyme was measured and evaluated as part of the cardiovascular studies that were conducted on ribosine. Collectively, these are the antioxidants that make up our antioxidant defense system that protects our cells against free radical damage by supporting the different groups or components of the antioxidant defense system becomes a strategy to promote healthy aging and incorporated as part of our product formulation rationale. The combination of antioxidants from food, the naturally produced antioxidants, and nutrients supporting the antioxidant enzymes provided in the MAX products will give us the best defense against oxidative stress. Oxidative stress was first defined in the 1980s by Professor Helmut Size, and if you think about it, really not too long ago. But now, oxidative stress is a ubiquitous term used to describe the situation when there are more free radicals being produced from metabolic and environmental sources, but not enough antioxidants within our system to neutralize all these free radicals. This imbalance is damaging to our cells. Oxidative stress with low glutathione levels has been associated with over 75 diseases and disorders which includes certain cardiovascular disorders like atherosclerosis and endothelial dysfunction, neurodegenerative diseases, which include Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, diabetes as a form of oxidative stress, macular degeneration and cataract formation has also been linked to this imbalance, many inflammatory diseases and disorders, male fertility, and the list just goes on and on. Well, now's a good time to transition and talk about glutathione and why it is considered the master antioxidant. Let me just say that glutathione is essential for our health. It happens to be the most abundant antioxidant in our tissues, naturally produced by the body for the purpose of being our natural cell protector. And therefore, it's no surprise that it's found in virtually all of our cells. Glutathione is considered the master antioxidant because it performs many cellular functions in the body, including supporting amino acid transport, DNA repair and synthesis, but it is best known for its three primary roles. As an antioxidant, it is capable of neutralizing many different types of free radicals. It is highly concentrated in our cells, and this is where antioxidants are most needed Glutathione is one of the few antioxidants found in the mitochondria of our cells to protect mitochondria DNA. And this is an extremely important function as mitochondria dysfunction has been linked to the development of many chronic diseases. Glutathione eliminates toxic environmental chemicals that we inhale and ingest through a process known as a glutathione detoxification pathway, which I plan to talk about here shortly. And as an immune system enhancer, glutathione helps regulate and protect our immune cells, and therefore is critical in maintaining a healthy immune system. Here is a chemical structure of, glut of the glutathione molecule. It is a tripeptide and contains three amino acids, glutamic acid, cysteine, and glycine. And it's a cysteine amino acid, as you can see, that has this SH group on it. And this SH group has a very important function. It is also known as a thiol or the sulfhydro group. And it's a sulfhydro group that is the electron donor that gives glutathione its antioxidant activity and its ability to detoxify many environmental toxins. And it's key 
to glutathione's function. But because the subhydro group gets oxidized very easily, losing its electron, its bioavailability is affected, making it difficult to get through the gastrointestinal system. Glutathione is available as a dietary supplement in the U.S., but really has limited value when taken orally. This free sulfhydro group that makes glutathione a powerful antioxidant and detoxifier, inherent to this property though, the glutathione molecule can be easily oxidized and also degraded by stomach and intestinal enzymes. Therefore, the majority of the scientific and medical community regard oral glutathione as an ineffective method to increase intercellular glutathione levels. Here is a biochemical pathway for the production of glutathione. We manufacture glutathione in our cells in two simple steps. Both steps require a specific enzyme and ATP as the energy source. The first step is the combining of the two amino acids, glutamic acid and cysteine, to form the intermediate gamma-glutamylcysteine. And the second and final step is the addition, addition of glycine to form glutathione. This glutathione production pathway happens to be homeostatically regulated, and our cells have the ability to increase or decrease glutathione production based upon the glutathione level within the cell. This ability to improve cellular glutathione is extremely important to the health of the cell. In oxidative stress, when the cell does not have enough antioxidants to neutralize all the free radicals that are being produced, resulting in lower glutathione levels, our cells will respond by activating this first enzyme, glutamate cysteine ligase, so our cells can produce more glutathione. And this is a defense mechanism our cells have to try to avoid oxidative stress by manufacturing additional glutathione. But glutathione's ability to rally in oxidative stress will depend on the amount of the cysteine amino acid as it is a rate-limiting amino acid for the production of glutathione. And this is a key concept. If the cysteine is in short supply, this will slow glutathione production, preventing glutathione's ability to rally in oxidative stress. Glutathione's response to oxidative stress is an example of how important glutathione is to the health of our cells, because it's glutathione that our cells will depend on to protect it from oxidative stress or cellular damage by manufacturing additional glutathione. So the cell can reestablish this critical balance between the free radicals and its antioxidant defense system, making glutathione a key component of this defense system that protects our cells against oxidative stress, which is further evidence why glutathione is considered the master antioxidant. Here is an illustration of glutathione functioning as an antioxidant. When we refer to glutathione, we are generally referring to glutathione in its reduced form or when it's capable of being an antioxidant. And it's designated as GSH, G standing for glutathione, and SH for that very important sulfhydro group. In the presence of a hydroxyl free radical, glutathione will give up its hydrogen and electron to this hydroxyl free radical, which will then be detoxified to water. After glutathione donates its electron, it will combine with another glutathione molecule that has also lost its electron to form the oxidized form of glutathione, or GSSG. In the medical literature, it's often referred to as glutathione disulfide. It is important to note that glutathione itself never becomes a free radical after donating its electron, but rather forms this oxidized form of glutathione, or GSSG. And this is not true for the majority of antioxidants, which become weak free radicals after donating their electron. I think one of the most unique features of glutathione, and certainly a point of distinction, is it's able to recycle itself unlike other antioxidants. So after glutathione donates its electron to neutralize a free radical, forming the oxidized form of glutathione, or GSSG, it can regenerate or recycle itself with the help of a glutathione enzyme, 
known as glutathione reductase. In other words, it can get from its oxidized form back into its reduced form so it can function as an antioxidant again. It can continue to neutralize free radicals over and over again through this process. It's also responsible for recycling other key antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E back to their active states. The ratio of the reduced form of glutathione and the oxidized form of glutathione, or GSSG, defines the redox balance of the cell, or the reduction oxidation balance of the cell, which indicates the health of the cell and its ability to resist toxic challenge. In oxidative stress, this ratio becomes smaller because glutathione is being utilized as an antioxidant, being converted to the oxidized form or GSSG. And when the redox becomes out of balance, this can affect cell signaling and function and influence the release of inflammatory cytokines. Our cells go through great lengths to maintain the redox balance because it's so important for the health of our cells. And this can be done in two ways, by de novo glutathione synthesis, or starting from the beginning, utilizing the amino acid building blocks, or we can utilize a salvage pathway and regenerate or recycle GSSG. Here are organ concentrations of glutathione in animals. Since glutathione is our natural cell protector, it is no coincidence it is highly concentrated in those organs most exposed to toxins and free radicals. With the liver having the highest concentration of glutathione, the next highest organ being the kidney, followed by the lung. The lung has a high concentration of glutathione because it's responsible for detoxifying many environmental toxins we inhale. The heart and brain have a high concentration of glutathione because of all the metabolic activity in these organs. And in humans, we would see a high concentration of glutathione in our skin, as well as the lens of our eyes, because glutathione protects against UV radiation, free radical damage. Our ability to detoxify and remove environmental toxins from the body is extremely important for our health. Many compounds that we're exposed to, like environmental chemicals and pollutants, even medications or drugs, these substances or compounds are not natural to the body and our body considers, considers them to be foreign, also known as xenobiotics. And we must have a way to remove or get rid of them, otherwise they will Otherwise, these compounds will quickly accumulate in our vital organs and cause toxicity and illness. The liver is primarily responsible for removing these xenobiotics, and it does this in two phases. The first phase of liver detoxification refers to the cytochrome P450 enzyme detoxification process, and these enzymes break down these compounds or xenobiotics by oxidizing them. The second phase takes the intermediates from phase one and converts them into water-soluble conjugates. And it's these conjugates that will be eliminated through the kidneys and bile. The majority of environmental toxins are fat-soluble. And phase two conjugation makes these compounds water-soluble in order to support the removal of these fat-soluble toxins from the body. Here's an illustration of phase two detoxification and specifically glutathione conjugation. As many of you may know, there are many different types of conjugation processes that are part of phase two detoxification. When we inhale and ingest toxic chemicals, drugs, and carcinogens, they will generally enter into phase one detoxification where they will be oxidized by the P450 enzymes, preparing them for phase two. When they enter into phase two, glutathione will actually attach to these toxic chemicals, drugs, and carcinogens with the help of the glutathione as transferase enzymes forming glutathione conjugates. These conjugates are water soluble, will be further broken down by the liver into smaller water soluble pieces so these fat soluble toxins can be eliminated through the kidneys. 
the glutathione detoxification process is responsible for the removal of many environmental toxins we come in contact on a daily basis, preventing their accumulation and toxicity, but at the expense of glutathione, as glutathione is lost through this process as glutathione conjugates. And this is one of many causes that can lead to glutathione depletion. Here's a short list of environmental chemicals that are detoxified by glutathione and their likely source of exposure. It is well known glutathione is a chelator of heavy metals, including mercury, lead, and cadmium. It's responsible for detoxifying many fat-soluble environmental chemicals, some of them carcinogens like benzene and benzopyronines that is found in smoke affluent. Also, it's responsible for detoxifying NAPQI, a toxic metabolite produced in acetaminophen or paracetamol overdose. And we'll talk about this next because it becomes important when we discuss the proof of concept study that demonstrated ribosine was effective in protecting the liver from this toxic metabolite. In the U.S., the Food and Drug Administration has been critical on the labeling of products that contain acetaminophen because they believe many consumers don't realize or are unaware that they're consuming acetaminophen in many of these combination products used to treat the common cold and flu. In fact, in the U.S., acetaminophen overdose is the leading cause of liver failure and accounts for over 50,000 emergency room visits annually. Here is the metabolic pathway for the removal of acetaminophen or paracetamol from the body after oral ingestion. At recommended doses, acetaminophen is non-toxic. It's safe for children and adults. It's a great pain reliever and can reduce fevers, as you know. And it's metabolized and eliminated by use of phase two detoxification only, forming water-soluble sulfate and glucuronic acid conjugates, which are eliminated through the urine. These conjugates are acidic, making them easier for the kidneys to remove. However, at high doses or overdose situation, both the sulfate and glucuronic acid conjugation pathways become overwhelmed or saturated. And the liver will attempt to remove acetaminophen by oxidizing it. Ironically, this produces a toxic and reactive metabolite known as NAPQI or NAPQI which is very toxic to both the liver and the kidney because it binds to cellular proteins. Glutathione is responsible for detoxifying NAPQI through glutathione conjugation, again with the help of the glutathione S transferase enzymes, forming the acetaminophen mercaptic acid conjugate, which is water soluble in the detoxified product that is excreted into the urine. At high doses or overdose situations, liver glutathione will eventually get depleted. And we're no longer going to be able to detoxify this very toxic metabolite, NAPQI, by glutathione conjugation. And therefore, these individuals will develop liver damage. As some of you may know, the antidote for acetaminophen overdose that's going to be administered in the emergency room is intravenous N acetylcysteine or NAC because it provides a rate limiting amino acid cysteine so glutathione can be manufactured and continue to detoxify the NAPQ metabolite, preventing further liver damage. Glutathione is an immune system enhancer and protects our lymphocytes by neutralizing the oxidizing substances produced during infection. It's also needed for the growth, reproduction, and differentiation of both T and B lymphocytes. In a study published in Immunopharmacology, they found a direct relationship between the availability of glutathione and lymphocyte proliferation confirming the importance of intracellular glutathione in maintaining a healthy immune system. Glutathione and viral infections 
With the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been a number of studies underway evaluating glutathione uh, and the precursors uh, for the coronavirus. For those of you interested in the status of these trials, you can access the website clinicaltrial.gov. In this particular study, uh, researchers at the prestigious Emory University School of Medicine measured the effects of glutathione on viral infections. Human airway epithelial cells were inoculated with the influenza virus, and these cells were cultured up to 72 hours in three different concentrations of glutathione. They found that glutathione significantly inhibited viral production especially at the higher concentrations of glutathione. These same researchers also studied the effects of glutathione on an influenza strain in mice. Four days after infection, the viral titer was measured and was significantly decreased in the lung and trachea in the animals that were treated with glutathione. And this decrease in viral titer was shown to be statistically significant. The authors concluded that the results suggest glutathione may provide an alternative strategy to limiting the influenza infection. Here is a study uh, that was published in the British journal Lancet on the relationship between glutathione and our health. This study evaluated four groups of individuals, 66 young healthy volunteers with a mean age in their mid-20s, 58 healthy elderly, by definition, they had no major medical problems in the last five years and were on no medications. Then we had 49 uh, elderly outpatients that were diagnosed to have a chronic disease and were being followed up in an outpatient clinic for management. And the final group were 47 elderly inpatients, all recently admitted to the hospital for an acute illness. The authors measured a marker for oxidative stress in this case, lipid hydroperoxide. And you would expect this marker to increase in oxidative stress. And they also evaluated glutathione levels. They reported that glutathione levels decrease with age 0.54 to 0.29 in your healthy elderly. And their glutathione levels also decrease as their health declines. They also found that the marker for oxidative stress significantly increased from 3.14 to 8.84 in the elderly inpatient admitted for an acute illness, indicating significant cellular oxidative stress in these hospitalized patients. Here's a study that was published in Carcinogenesis on the relationship between glutathione levels and age. They measured blood glutathione levels in three different age groups, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and 60 to 80 for both males and females. And they found that glutathione levels decreased with increasing age regardless of gender. And the reason for this decrease, the first enzyme responsible for glutathione production, glutamate cysteine ligase, become less efficient as we age, and therefore less glutathione is produced. There are many causes that deplete our glutathione levels, which is a rationale for supplementation. As I mentioned, exposure to environmental toxins and pollutants, their removal and detoxification through the glutathione detoxification pathway can lead to glutathione depletion. In addition, the many causes related to free radical formation can lower our glutathione levels including getting older. So these are all good reasons why we need to consider glutathione supplementation in order to maintain optimal glutathione levels. In June of this year, uh, in the prestigious Journal of Infectious Disease, a publication of the American Chemical Society, the author suggests that the deficiency of endogenous glutathione is the underlying cause of serious illness and death in the elderly COVID-19 patients. Specifically, in the elderly, there are age-related and disease-related impaired redox homeostasis and associated oxidative stress, which contributes to the more severe outcomes. He mentions this decline in glutathione with age and points out that many of these individuals also have chronic diseases associated with low glutathione levels. 
anybody interested in reading this paper can access the ACS journal website. The need to increase glutathione levels through supplementation led to ribosine development. As I mentioned earlier, there are over 150,000 published studies on glutathione. Most of them focus on glutathione's role as a cell protector, with very few researchers directed on the delivery of glutathione. Dr. Herbert Nagasawa happened to be an exception. As a professor of medicinal chemistry and toxicology at the University of Minnesota, he recognized the need to maintain optimal glutathione levels, but also the limitations of the dietary supplements, glutathione and cysteine and therefore targeted his research to overcome the bioavailability issues inherent to glutathione supplementation. Many of the 186 peer-reviewed publications by Dr. Nagasawa were focused on better delivery methods to improve endogenous glutathione. He happened to also be a senior career research scientist at the VA Medical Center. His laboratories were considered to be experts in glutathione chemistry, and dedicated over 25 years of research to improve and develop better dietary supplements to support the natural production of glutathione. Dr. Nagasawa's interest in glutathione began in the early 1980s. As a scientist for the VA Medical Center, he focused his research on ailments that afflicted the hospitalized veteran. And his concern was the high incidence of alcohol abuse amongst the veterans with many of them admitted to the hospital for the treatment of alcohol liver disease. It was observed that individuals with alcohol liver disease had low liver glutathione levels. So research focused on the improvement of liver glutathione in hopes this would prevent the progression of this disease. It was also known that individuals that chronically abused alcohol had poor dietary habits and they would often binge drink where alcohol becomes a substitute for food. And therefore they were not consuming the necessary amino acids or proteins that the body requires to produce sufficient glutathione. Dr. Nagasawa strongly believed if he could provide these veterans with an effective dietary supplement that would support the natural production of glutathione, you could prevent individuals with alcohol liver disease progressing into a much more serious condition known as alcohol liver cirrhosis, which is irreversible and will eventually lead to death without a liver transplant. Since cysteine is a rate limiting amino acid for the production of glutathione, to deliver it orally would require a bioavailable form. The challenge was to protect this amino acid during the absorption phase in order to minimize its breakdown so it could be utilized to support the natural production of glutathione. As a medicinal chemist, Dr. Nagasawa was convinced if he could protect the fragile sulfhydro group on cysteine, this would significantly improve its bioavailability and would be the solution to the problem. They accomplished this by attaching a natural sugar to cysteine, and the sugar happened to be ribose, a common sugar found in the body which is utilized to manufacture ATP. Ribose is a sugar aldehyde or what we call a reducing sugar and will spontaneously condense to the amino acid cysteine to form ribosine, fully protecting that fragile sulfhydro group, improving cysteine's bioavailability. And once in total body water will non-enzymatically rehydrate into its two natural components, ribose and cysteine, where ribose can support ATP production and cysteine can be incorporated into the glutathione production pathway. The technology appears simple, but it actually took thousands of dedicated research hours by many different disciplines, including biochemists, organic chemists, pharmacologists, and medicinal chemists that ultimately led to ribosine's development. And ribosine's effectiveness in improving glutathione levels has been published in many peer-reviewed journals. 
How was ribosine tested? It showed that it was effective in raising glutathione levels. So let's discuss the studies that were conducted in Polish and ribosine that demonstrated it was effective in increasing glutathione by starting with the research hypothesis. What was known was individuals that chronically abused alcohol had low liver glutathione levels. And this decrease in glutathione increases oxidative stress in the liver, which will then cause liver damage. This is another very important concept. In chronic alcohol abuse, liver glutathione is decreased. Therefore, the liver no longer has enough antioxidants to neutralize the damaging free radicals that are being produced. This will result in the liver being in a state of chronic oxidative stress. And over the years, these individuals will develop alcohol liver disease. The key question was, can you prevent liver damage due to chronic alcohol abuse by replenishing liver glutathione? In other words, could a bioavailable cysteine supplement increase liver glutathione, which will result in a decrease in liver oxidative stress by reestablishing this critical balance between the free radicals and antioxidants by increasing liver glutathione? If so, this could be an effective way to prevent liver damage from occurring. So how was ribosine tested to show that it actually worked? If we assume that ribosine can effectively increase liver glutathione, we should be able to demonstrate that it can prevent liver damage based on its ability to decrease oxidative stress by reestablishing the balance between the free radicals and antioxidants. In order to demonstrate this, they needed to have a valid model to test their hypothesis in. Testing this hypothesis in a human clinical trial would be cost prohibitive since the damage to the liver due to chronic alcohol abuse occurs over decades of life and to demonstrate ribosine's protective effect over such a long period of time becomes impractical. So it requires an animal model, generally a mouse model, that can mimic liver damage caused by chronic oxidative stress or mimics liver damage caused by chronic depletion of liver glutathione. Dr. Nagasawa created a model where the animal was put in an environment of oxidative stress that severely depleted the liver glutathione, resulting in liver damage similar to alcohol liver disease, and then administered ribosine to observe whether it would protect the animal from liver damage due to severely depleting their liver glutathione. The animal model used to mimic alcohol liver disease administered a high dose of acetaminophen to these animals. As we discussed, extremely high doses of acetaminophen will deplete liver glutathione and will cause liver damage that happens to be very similar to what's seen in alcohol liver disease. So giving high dose acetaminophen becomes a very good short-term model that can be used by researchers to mimic liver damage caused by oxidative stress or chronic alcohol abuse. This model allowed Dr. Nagasawa to screen many compounds that had a high probability to increase liver glutathione and could compare them and rank them for their efficacy. These studies could be completed over several months as opposed to years or decades and is an acceptable model in the scientific community to mimic liver damage caused by oxidative stress, or an acceptable model to mimic alcohol liver disease. Here is the first study that was published on ribosine. This was an animal model that evaluated the compound's ability to protect the animal against liver damage from a toxic dose of acetaminophen. This study tested nine compounds all known to have varying degrees of elevating glutathione levels and included ribosine and N-acetylcysteine, or NAC. They found that ribosine was the only compound tested where no mice died during the study. It was the only compound which showed no significant liver damage due to high dose acetaminophen. All other compounds tested, which included NAC, unfortunately had animal deaths due to significant liver damage. 
This study demonstrated that rivalcine can protect the liver from a toxic dose of acetaminophen by effectively increasing liver glutathione. And it did so better than all the other compounds it was tested against. Here's a summary of the study findings. The animals that were administered only a very high dose of acetaminophen out of the 12 animals in this group, only two survived at 48 hours, or a 17% survival rate. Post-mortem, 11 of those animals had severe or four plus necrosis of the liver. The animals that were given NAC with a toxic dose of acetaminophen had a 94% survival rate at 48 hours, with two of the animals having significant liver damage exhibiting three and four plus necrosis of the liver. The animals that received ribosine shortly after a toxic dose of acetaminophen had a 100% survival rate at 48 hours, and no animals were noted to have severe liver damage. In this published study, when ribosine was compared to NAC and their ability to increase liver cell glutathione, ribosine clearly outperformed NAC. Here is some data from the study. You can see that even when two and a half times more NAC was given, the glutathione levels were 30% lower than they were with ribosine. Another way of looking at it, ribosine was at least 300% more effective in raising liver glutathione than NAC was in this liver cell system. Ribosine was not only shown to increase liver glutathione, but was also able to restore depleted glutathione in many other organs. Incidentally, this type of study cannot be done in the humans because it requires the biopsies of the different organs. So the best way to study the effects of ribosine in the different organs is through the use of an animal model. In this animal model, the mice were put in an environment of oxidative stress, depleting glutathione in their various organs. They evaluated a number of the animal's organs, but because of the limited space of the slide, selected four key organs, the kidney, the lung, muscle, and heart. On your left is the measured glutathione levels in these organs. The green bar represents the animals with normal glutathione. The black is the glutathione levels in the animals in oxidative stress or depleted glutathione levels. And the gray bar are the animals in oxidative stress, but were also given ribosine. As you can see, ribosine was able to restore organ glutathione levels back to normal in these very key organs. The ribosine technology was issued a U.S. patent in 2013. The title of the patent is a method to enhance the delivery of glutathione and ATP levels in cells. I think the title says it all. This technology is proprietary to Max International. There are currently 32 peer-reviewed published studies on ribosine. These studies were conducted over a period of 30 plus years. The first proof of concept study that we covered was published in 1987, where ribosine demonstrated it could protect against a toxic dose of acetaminophen by raising liver glutathione levels. This was a pivotal study because ribosine showed such good protection, the National Institutes of Health continued to fund ribosine research because they felt it was worthy of further study. It's important to point out that these 32 published studies were not funded by Max International, but rather by the National Institutes of Health and other governmental agencies, including universities. There have been nine published studies since 2017, with three published studies already this year. There were two published studies on cardiovascular health conducted by Dr. Sally McCormick from the University of Otago, New Zealand, one using human lipoprotein A, transgenic mice, and the other using APOE deficient mice. Since these two studies had very positive results, she was able to obtain funding from a research foundation to initiate a human clinical trial to determine if this preclinical data will translate to humans. We anticipate that this study will be completed later this year. 
There have been recent published studies that investigate the effectiveness of ribosine in chronic diseases that are associated with oxidative stress, such as male fertility, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. These studies utilize the most advanced animal models, and I'm excited to report that these results were once again very positive. I encourage each of you to log on to the MAX website to get the reference or PubMed to review the study yourself. Please stay safe and healthy, and thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. I always appreciate your lectures and have taken pages of notes, as I always do. Uh, for our medical and health professionals, as with Dr. Smith's presentation, the bibliography I have compiled for you will contain all of the studies cited in Dr. Nagasawa's presentation. If our medical and health professionals have questions for either Dr. Smith or Dr. Nagasawa, please submit those to me at the following email address, ribose, R-I-B-O-S-E, cysteine, C-Y-S-T-E-I-N-E, -E, at max.com. Again, that is ribose, cysteine, at max.com. Our host for this medical symposium was Max International, a company devoted to global education on clinically proven nutritional science. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Joseph Wojtyki, the CEO of Max International, for his closing remarks and a special announcement for the medical and health professionals in attendance today. Joe was instrumental in the ribosine technology being acquired by Max International in 2009. Please help me welcome Mr. Joseph Wojtyki. Joe? Thank you, Bobby. And thank you, Dr. Margie Smith and Dr. Scott Nagasawa for your wonderful presentations in this symposium. Uh, we appreciate your dedication to excellent science and your great explanations to the science behind ribosine and glutathione. What I have seen throughout the world since I joined Max International in 2009 is the importance of excellent science. And Dr. Herbert Nagasawa, by inventing ribosine and wanting to share the importance of glutathione around the world, has had a tremendous impact on so many people in so many different countries. Science and its quality and thorough research is very, very important at Max International. We've developed a, a portal for medical and healthcare professionals so that they can have a one-stop location to learn about ribosine and glutathione. These resources will be of great importance for you as you explain glutathione to your patients and those that you encounter. The healthcare professional portal is ribocysteine.com. We also want all of your questions to be answered. So please send your questions to ribocysteine at max.com. We also would really appreciate your feedback about this medical symposium and topics that may be of interest to you for future symposiums. So please get back to the person who invited you to today's presentation to share your ideas. We want to thank you for your time coming in to see the science behind ribosine and glutathione. We look forward to seeing all of you again in the near future. And be assured that Max's commitment to science is following the vision of Dr. Herbert P. Nagasawa. We will always give our best to present excellent science, the highest quality products, and we want to educate and share that science with medical professionals around the world. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again at the next medical symposium.